Well, welcome everyone uh, to a, um, another ethical corporation by Reuters Events webinar on best practice supplier engagement. I'm Ed Long, I head up our North American uh, portfolio ethical corporation. Um, hope you're all keeping well and, and safe in, in particularly difficult times. Um, so today's webinar, as, as mentioned, is on best practice supplier engagement. So um, more and more companies are setting ambitious sustainability targets to decarbonize their supply chains. Uh, today we'll be hearing how companies are designing and implementing uh, strategies uh, with suppliers um, and continuing to get, engage them for transparency and visibility purposes. Um, to understand these latest approaches, I'm delighted to welcome three incredibly uh, knowledgeable experts today. Uh, we have joining us Philippe LeCamp, who's the SVP of the Americas for Cafe Pacific Airways, Pilar Bennett, uh, Manager of Supply Chain at CDP, Megan Ryan, uh, Global Sustainability Sourcing and Sustainable Agriculture Manager at PepsiCo. And today moderating uh, will be Ellen Griezmann, uh, the analyst at uh, Future 500. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, today's webinar um, will be a form of a panel discussion. On the right hand side, you'll see a box where you can post your questions. Uh, please do post your key questions throughout the webinar and we'll aim to get these answered for you. Um, and it's my pleasure to hand over to Ellen to, to get the discussion over, uh, underway. Thank you, Ellen. Great, thanks, Ed. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are joining us from in the world. Um, as Ed mentioned, my name is Ellen Griesemer. I'm an analyst at Future 500. We're a nonprofit consultancy that builds trust and finds common ground between NGOs, philanthropists, investors, and companies to advance business as a force for good. So welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. I really hope you and your families are staying healthy and well, but know that that may not be the case for some of you. And just want you to know that our, our hearts are, are with you. And I know I miss seeing all your faces in New York in March, but I'm really pleased that Ethical Core has been able to pivot to virtual so we can have this conversation um, here today. I think it is so important to um, continue the climate conversation amidst everything that's going on. And I'm sure you've all been seeing on social media as well, um, you know, hashtag let's flatten this curve too. So, um, so let's jump into it. So I'd, I'd like to have uh, each of our panelists just very briefly introduce themselves. Um, Megan, Pilar, Philippe, please give us the 30 second snapshot about your company and just some quick context about how you're approaching our conversation today. Sure, happy to start, Ellen, and um, thank you to Ethical Corp for inviting PepsiCo and inviting me to the conversation. Uh, my name is Megan Ryan. I work for PepsiCo as part of the Global Sustainable Agriculture and Sustainable Sourcing Group. Um, as a global food and beverage company with products in Jordan in more than 200 markets, our sustainability agenda is really anchored in helping to build a more sustainable food system. And I think that's more important now than ever before. And with so many pressures facing the global food system, including climate change. So for us, um, decarbonization and working in our supply chain is critically important to our vision of a more sustainable food system and looking forward to the conversation today and talking more about what we see as best practice and supplier engagement. Great. Hi, I'm Philippe LeCamp from uh, Cathay Pacific Airways. I uh, look after the Americas. I've um, been with the company 28 years. Cathay is 74 years old. And it's part of a conglomerate that is a family run business. It's 204 years old, sixth generation chairman in place. And, and that's important because it, it teaches us about the longer term. We're not measured on quarters by our shareholders, we're measured on decades uh, and generations. So we, we are really held responsible for the impact that we make. You'll have noticed the cleaner skies outside, a lot of people are talking about them. Our role is to make sure that we are decarbonizing our industry and doing what we can to make sure that those clean skies remain long term. And, Hi, and my name is Pilar Bennett. I work with CDP, formerly known as the Carbon Disclosure Project. We are an environmental nonprofit organization and we run a data platform for companies to disclose environmental data, including climate change, water security, and forest risk data. Um, we work on behalf of both investors and large purchasing organizations that are using this environmental data to help make decisions. Um, so I work on the supply chain side. I work with large purchasing organizations like um, General Motors, McDonald's, and Stanley Black & Decker as they collect data from our, um, using our platform from their suppliers um, to help measure and manage their environmental footprint. 
Great. Um, so let's just set the scene a little bit before we dig in. Um, can you just all kind of give us an overview about why you think supplier engagement is um, a critical piece of, of decarbonizing supply chains? Does somebody want to jump in? Sure, happy to start us off. Um, so for PepsiCo, we have, like many companies, a science-based target to reduce our emissions. Our target is 20% by 2030, and that ambition really helps to guide our climate work overall, but also really specifically shapes our approach to supplier engagement. Um, as you can imagine, given our company and our portfolio, our supply chain is quite large and quite complex, and we really see it as a key channel through which we can work on our science-based target and our overall ambitions around sustainability. And you know, for us, this is it's a really huge effort and it takes many of us across PepsiCo to activate this vision of engaging with our suppliers. Um, and for me, uh, you know, my role in this and the lens that I bring is looking specifically at our agricultural greenhouse gas footprint. Uh, scope three emissions is really significant for PepsiCo and within that agricultural admissions is the largest slice of the pie, if you will. So focusing really specifically on that group of suppliers and thinking together about how we can come to common ground where we can find win-win solutions where suppliers may also have commitments on climate change or begin to see some of the impacts, even physical impacts of climate change to their own businesses as agricultural companies in their own right. Finding those common ground objectives where we can then build together solutions to decarbonize is really critical to, uh, to what we do. Great. Is that resonating for, for others or anybody have a little bit of a, a different approach? Yeah, sure. Um, from 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 Cathay's perspective, um, we have both reactive and proactive. So, you know, similar to Megan, we have clear goals that are set out in terms of our overall impact areas. Um, and there are some some for so if we take an example of biofuel, it's quite clear that we need to be decarbonizing our the, the fuel supply chain. We, we're very active in that space. Um, but in, in some areas, we will go out to suppliers and say, we know we want to reduce single-use plastics, for example. How do we do it? What are the what are the, what are the products that you've got? How can we work with you to enable the introduction of more sustainable materials? So it's 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 very much a two-way street. And I say from the CDP perspective, you know, we're working with both a lot of customers and a lot of suppliers, and we've seen that the average kind of ratio of supply chain emissions to direct carbon emissions is typically five and a half to one. So it's a massive, massive component of a typical company's greenhouse gas footprint. Um, it depends on industry. So, you know, five and a half to one is the average, but um, for something like power generation, it might be one to one, whereas retail, it's like 11 to one or something wild. Um, so I think it, it depends on the industry, but on average companies are starting to understand and recognize that it's a big component of their footprint. Yeah, absolutely can't really address the the whole pie without without getting to the meat of it. Okay, great. Um, well, I think that that's really helpful to kind of frame up our, our conversation. So I, I do want to talk a little bit about how COVID is influencing things um, today. But first, let's reach back to uh, 2019, if we can remember um, what already feels like years ago. Um, and can you all just talk a little bit about how you approach supplier engagement, what that looked like pre-COVID and what you'd consider to be good practice. So, you know, we've we've heard how important it is to engage suppliers to reach some of your goals, but what does that engagement actually look like? Are you calling them up on the phone? Are you visiting? Are you engaged in ongoing relationships? How do you get that going? Just give us a sense of kind of the methodologies and kind of the practical side of it. I can start off. Um, so I think, you know, building on something Philippe said, I think, you know, part of how we approach this is really treating our suppliers with respect and seeing them as partners and collaborators on a decarbonization journey. So in general, we try not to take an approach of kind of dictating or being 
truly prescriptive about what we want suppliers to do because we think that in the end really driving supplier ownership of the concept of decarbonization is going to be the most effective way to make change of course we do want to also drive accountability and it's also always a balance between how do we apply enough influence and pressure to make sure that the focus stays where we want it to be but also create space for suppliers to really look at their own business understand their climate risks and make choices that are going to make sense for them as a business rather than being simply responsive to customer demands and customer asks. So I think that's really core to understanding our methodology and some of the detail about how we go about it is, is thinking about, you know, what are sort of the guiding principles that we use when we approach our suppliers and think about what we want to ask of them and how we want to partner with them on, on carbon issues. And then I think, you know, some of the tactics that work for us, and of course, you know, we don't see ourselves as having figured this out. If, if we had, we'd be dropping our emissions a lot faster um, so there's a lot of room for learning but a couple of the things that work well for us I think the first one that comes to mind is prioritization uh, with such a large supply chain it's really critical for us to bring focus to our supplier engagement activities we have a lot of priorities when it comes to engaging with suppliers, not only sustainability topics, but also commercial topics, R&D, innovation. There are many things that we want to ask of suppliers and there's only a certain amount of share of mind. So I think prioritizing and really focusing on either, you know, the most carbon intensive suppliers or the suppliers that we think have the largest reduction potential, where we think resilience building is more important, being really laser focused and really clear about which set of suppliers we want to target and why. Uh, has been really helpful to us and is a helpful way to also bring our organization along when we want to visit with procurement and other internal stakeholders to say these are the suppliers that we really want to uh, to pair up with and to, to lean in and, and go deep. Here's the rationale for why. So prioritization is key. Um, and I think the, the second one that I'd call out is balancing breadth with depth because we know that we want to lean in with certain suppliers that may be uh, larger for us, maybe bigger volumes, maybe larger emission sources, but we also need to cover off quite a lot of the supply chain to really hit our goals and to go as fast as we know uh, the urgency of the situation demands. So we try to think about strategies that give us breath, um, like asking suppliers to disclose to CDP is a great example of that, where we can take a really consistent approach. We can cover off quite a lot of the supply chain in one go. Um, I think that's really important to us is having some of those markers that are consistent that can cover off a lot of the supply chain and give us that breath. But then also we want to have depth. So we've selected a handful of suppliers that we really see as strategic partners on our decarbonization journey. And for those suppliers, we might be doing much more in-depth engagement, having top-to-top -to -top meetings annually with their leadership and ours and creating work plans for multi-year decarbonization actions and spending a lot more time and resource with particular suppliers so I think that has been another another key for us so prioritizing and then thinking about breadth versus depth that's awesome um, before we before we move to somebody else can you just give us um, a little bit more of a sense about how you go about the prioritization so you mentioned like high impact suppliers so does that start with like um, you know a greenhouse gas assessment or what kicks off that prioritization process yeah, certainly. I mean, like many companies, we um, have a pretty good understanding of our footprint. We um, do annual updates to take a look at that. So we have a good understanding of where our emissions are coming from and a good understanding of our supply chain. We've been fortunate to have been involved in CDP supply chain for quite some time. So we also have a, a fairly good data set at this point to help us to help guide that decision making and that prioritization. And some of this, uh, you know, it's art and science. So some of it can be guided by what the data is telling us by quantitative measures of where we should focus, but some of it's also based on relationships and based on what we see in terms of supplier maturity and willingness to partner. So if we start to see suppliers um, that maybe we previously hadn't worked with setting their own science-based targets or beginning right. to talk more openly about climate change, maybe a new CEO has come on board, it shows us that there's maybe more of a willingness to collaborate and partner, and that might change some of our decision calculus. So it's a blend of what the numbers tell us, what science tells us, and also um, where we think there's gonna be willing partners on the other side of the table. Great, yeah, that two-way street that uh, Philippe mentioned as well. Um, Philippe, um, over to you. Thoughts about? Yeah, thanks. Uh... 
Thanks, yeah, I mean, Megan raises some really, really good points. And I think the, the transparency of information is obviously critical. And, and actually, similarly, we've been working with CDP. In fact, we helped set up the offices in China uh, about 15 years ago for CDP. And, and, and clearly, once you start to have transparency of your impact, you can start to manage it. And I would say that for, for, for Cathay, we probably look at this in, in two distinct ways. One is the customer facing piece and the other is the industry facing piece. So from the industry side, clearly the biggest impact is is fuel use. So, you know, we've we've actively gone out. We've, we're actually one of the first airlines in the world to invest in the technology around sustainable fuels, not because we can use it today, but because we can see the importance of that as a major contributor to the carbon uh, throughout the aviation industry. But on the customer facing side, we actually have a, a customer experience team that specifically looks at the products that we want to have, that we know that our customers are keen to receive and, and actively seek for sustainable alternatives to those products where, where, where they're not sustainably sourced. So it's very much for us, it's a case of biggest bang for the buck. You know, we, we want to have things that you can see quite clearly. We talk about the transparency so a customer can understand that, let's take single use plastics or, or sustainable seafood, perhaps might be another good example. Very visible. You can see it, you can engage with your customers on that, um, whereas it's slightly more difficult to engage with customers at this stage on the fact that we've got a 10% blend of biofuel. Um, doesn't quite resonate in the same way. So, you know, it, it's very important that we go through this entire process and balance that, as I said, that's sort of the biggest bang for the buck as we focus on uh, the specific products within those supply chains. So it sounds like what you're saying is you're, you're thinking through the lens of what the customer sees and, and using some of that to drive how you engage with, with suppliers and what changes you make and what you prioritize. Is that, does that feel fair to you? Yeah, well, absolutely. We, we can see where our biggest impacts are. Again, the transparency of information, the biofuel uh, as an example. But absolutely, it's very important that we, we are engaging with the, the customer because ultimately, it, that's that's the demand side for us, right? And that helps us sure. as we look at things um, that can make a material difference to our overall impact. Great. Um, and so, from the CDP side, any any thoughts here about kind of the yeah, practical side I, of engaging? Uh, Yes, I think Megan brought up some really good points about, you know, kind of trying to choose the subset of suppliers that you want to engage with. I think um, one thing that we see with customers that are coming um, to us for the first time is they maybe are trying to boil the ocean and you can't engage, all, you know, tens of thousands of suppliers. Um, and for some of the big purchasing organizations, they do have tens of thousands. So what we recommend is typically start, you know, if you don't yet have an understanding of the environmental component, start with your spend with those companies. So maybe look at, say, 60% of your top spend, and that'll really narrow it down. Um, so maybe you're engaging with two to 500 suppliers and not, you know, 20,000. So I'd say that's one um, kind of place to start to, to try to narrow down those strategic suppliers. Um, I would also say kind of Next key component is communication is key. Um, you know, it could be in the form of, you know, emails or webinars or perhaps in-person supplier training. Um, we really, we see all of those. But I would say, you know, at the beginning, set expectations for your supplier. So let them know why you're interested and how you plan to use the data that they're providing to you. Um, because they want to know that, you know, this really matters to you and they want to understand why. Um, so, you know, don't be afraid to um, you know, send reminder emails, but also they want to receive your guidance. So share resources, share the tools that you've used in the past to calculate your own footprint, especially for suppliers that are just starting this. Um, and I would say, you know, to, to the extent that you can, make it kind of a full circle process. So provide feedback after they have um, disclosed information to you. So that's one thing that we um, really encourage customers to share with their suppliers. Um, and again, that feedback could take the form of emails or um, you know, perhaps an in, in-person in meeting or an annual review. And that kind of gets to my second point, which is to integrate these sustainability um, you know, data points and, and criteria into your pre-existing 
procurement tools. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. You can go ahead and use the tools that your procurement team has in place. So it may be a contract language, or it may be scorecards, or perhaps your procurement team has an annual supplier award ceremony. And so you can kind of start to put in sustainability awards and metrics into that conversation. Um, and then the, the last bit would also be to, you know, as, as Megan mentioned, you can't quite do it for everybody, but perhaps to schedule those one-on-one -on -one, um, annual supplier reviews. So again, to do it in conjunction with the procurement team, but to focus in on those key sustainability data points that really matter to you and your team. Um, and again, those data points can help you to identify which suppliers you want to have those conversations with. So you can tell whether a supplier is leading or lagging and which ones you need to talk to and about what. Um, so I'll pause there, but I think that's kind of our a, a broad look at how we um, see companies engaging with their suppliers. Great. Ellen, could I build um, one more point onto this? I think, yeah, this raised a, an idea for me and um, mm -hmm. I think a, a number of good points. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that has also been helpful for us as we've continued our journey and had, you know, some experience under our belt and some projects that we've done with suppliers is also coming to suppliers with some ideas about how they can start to think about where reduction potential is going to be cost effective. And so showing them some examples either from our own operations or from our agricultural supply chains in which we're purchasing from farmers more directly. And then we want to speak with our ag agribusiness suppliers, being able to come to with some ideas around here, are some things that we invested in. Here was the ROI of our investment and being able to be transparent where we can about that. And for us, it helps us, it feeds back into our prioritization exercise as well to say, okay, if we found that the ROI of our investment in our agricultural suppliers and actually investing in sinking carbon into soils has a better ROI for us in terms of metric tons of carbon reduced than some of our CapEx investments that we can make. That helps us to say, okay, this is really an area to focus on and let's prioritize trying to go to some of our top suppliers in those categories and encourage them to adopt these practices that we know have a really great return. So coming with some solutions and not only, as Pilar mentioned, and really important, the clear communication about what the goals are and what our expectations are, but also a little bit of a tool toolbox if you will, with some examples about how they can get started and what some of the cost effective ways that they might be able to make changes in their business could look like. Great. Um, thanks. I, I, I see some questions coming in and I do want to get to those. So just a reminder um, that if, uh, if, you're, if you're joining us and you have a question, pop it into the chat box and we'll kind of pepper in your questions uh, throughout our conversation. So that's perfect. Um, but before we do that, um, Philippe, I just wanted to see if you, um, something interesting that came out of our, our prep conversation was a comment you had made about, um, you know, kind of which suppliers you're engaging and being an airline, you, you sparked something that I hadn't quite thought about, which was thinking of, you know, the airports that you're working with, you know, as a form of supplier as well. And that was just sort of a, a different way of thinking about the supplier definition and conversation. And just wondered if you wanted to, to add anything here. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, no, I, th I think you know, that discussion was really around um, the ecosystem, if you like. Uh, you know, it, it's very important. We, we, we are clearly, a, again, there's a two-way relationship when you're looking at an airport um, as, as an airline. And, and we share very common goals. Um, similarly, we can bring, as Megan was saying, we can bring best practice to where we, we're using certain suppliers on, mm -hmm. on various products or sustainable seafood those kinds of examples but equally we, we can look at where we make an, an overall impact for the local community and, and air quality would be a very good example for that so again you know once you've you've done your cdpvs you've you've got some transparency around the data and the, the emissions footprint you can then start to engage with fuel suppliers um, ground service equipment you can you can nudge cajole engage with the supply chain to to reduce their carbon impact within the supply chain so again as we look at sort of scope three in that regard it's very important that we we're able to do that and, and an airport clearly can can have a significant impact on consumer behavior so where where we can we can start to translate some of the the the, the imperfections within some of the products that we have you know we can start to engage with the the airport themselves 
to be driving that, that change of customer behavior. Great. Um, so we have a, a, a good question here that I want to ask um, from our audience about um, how are you all supporting um, SME suppliers who, who may not necessarily have the resources to gather emissions data? So any support for, for smaller suppliers? And um, Pilar, happy to have uh, CDP's thoughts on, on this if, if there's something you want to chime in with. Yes, it's a really good question. And I think there are a couple of, there's actually a new development, um, but I'll start first with kind of in the past, what we recommend is, you know, with regard to the CDP questionnaire, if you're not yet in a place where, you know, your supplier can be, can, can report quantitative data, so that scope one, two emissions, um, then to focus first on the qualitative, the narrative responses, because that helps explain to a customer you know what the supplier is thinking about what some of their challenges are maybe why they haven't been able to focus on gathering their emissions data yet mm -hmm. um, and then i would say you know of the different scopes we really encourage suppliers to tackle scope two first it's kind of usually the most straightforward because it comes from your electricity bills and that kind of thing um, so to kind of get them familiar with that lingo um, is is where we would start and then i would say um, on the you know, kind of target setting side, um, there is actually new methodology that was just released by the science-based target initiative, specifically for SMEs. Um, so you know, we recognize that they might not have the capacity um, to do as in-depth of a science-based target review as some of the larger companies. Um, so I can speak more about that later, but um, that's kind of our general approach with SMEs. Ooh, great. Um, give me a reminder later because I want to I want to hear more about that. Um, Megan, um, SAB suppliers that you might be working with? Yeah, I think this for us is an opportunity area. You know, I spoke a lot about prioritization and how that has been imp important in guiding us. And I think, as you can imagine, you know, a lot of the results of that prioritization have pointed us toward larger suppliers being the sure. ones that are probably most ready, most mature, most likely to also have a sustainability team and a goal and focus on this. So, um, you know, I, I would say that the majority of our efforts have been focused on the larger suppliers in, in our supply chain. But equally, you know, when we look at our agricultural supply chains, we have have so many small holders in our supply chains and we see them as well as partners on the decarbonization journey but what that looks like may not be asking them to do a carbon footprint it may be you know helping to stand up a project that works on deforestation or reforestation issues in our palm oil supply chains for example so i think we've taken very very different approaches with our truly small scale suppliers and really thinking about you know what is what are the barriers that they are facing to be able to take steps that are going to have carbon carbon benefits, as well as, you know, very importantly, economic benefits and benefits in terms of livelihoods to the workers and the farmers that are, you know, so critical to their communities. Um, so I think, you know, our approach has been to do things that are a lot more bespoke with our smaller suppliers, mm -hmm. this concept of breadth and depth. And, I, you know, I think it's a little bit harder to have a really consistent expectation for smaller suppliers. But I think, you know, as we continue in our journey and we kind of move beyond our, you know, first tier uh, of large suppliers that we've really prioritized, I think considering how we can accelerate some of our SMEs will be part of our the next phase of our journey. And I think we'll take the learnings of what worked with engagement from large suppliers, what works in our very, very bespoke engagement with small holders, and how do we really tackle the middle? And I'm excited Great. to hear this development from CDP because I think that could be a, a space that we leverage as well. Awesome. Shall I tip in on, on where we are with um, SMEs? Sure. Um, we, we're looking at it really from a from a uh, from a cluster perspective. So we, we have obviously our major suppliers, and as Megan outlines, you know we, we're, we're clearly engaged with them. They can make the biggest material impact now. But for example, we, we've set up some things like little clean tech clusters. So where we've got a specific problem, a specific product that we're, we're looking to find solutions, it may well be you know some very small startups, SMEs who can provide the kind of flexibility and agility around the, the, the product design that, that mm. is of great value to us. I mean, I'll give you one little example, you know, where we were looking at um, in-flight carpets, um, and we found a supplier who actually, uh, very much an SME, who was using waste fishing nets from the reefs in Southeast Asia and repurposing that nylon into in-flight carpets. 
fantastic. You know, a, a little niche supplier, we'd never have found that looking at our larger supply chain. So, so we, we, we're clearly identifying a specific products where we can see opportunity and, and designing these, uh, these, these clusters uh, around them. So that we're sort of sharing that learning and, and finding out the latest technology developments. Awesome. Oh, okay, you just mentioned technology. Um, great, so just briefly, we have another audience question regarding tools or resources for collaborating with suppliers that you found uh, most useful or user-friendly. So um, I know we've mentioned, you know, email and of course CVP. Are there, you know, other communication methods or or uh, tools you're using that you can share? I'm trying to think of something. I think in general we have done things in a, I don't know, a fairly old school way of, you know, setting up meetings, spending time with suppliers, having dialogue has been the best tool for us. I, I don't think it's been as much through a, you know, a digital tool or, so, or something like that that has really helped us um, on this journey. It has been a lot more, you know, time spent and relationship building that we've used, but curious if others have uh, have suggestions or things that they've explored. I would say we're, we're much more open to, to cold calls than we used to be. Um, you know, we, we, we're very aware that there are potentially some technologies, some product development that is out there that we, we simply don't know about. So where we would normally be, you know, going through your in, inbox, deleting anything you don't recognize, today we are very open to, to anybody who has ideas in, in any of the verticals within the industry. So I would, I would really encourage people, you know, keep use it use any medium you can whether it's social media uh emails those approaches to companies like us um, i think can be much much more effective than they were great and pilar from the cdp side support around kind of cdp tools yes so we have a lot of tools a lot of guidance documents um sometimes the extent to the extent it could be overwhelming but um I would say, you know, our website itself is a kind of a wealth of resources. Um, you can find a lot of guidance there around, you know, why disclose, what are, what's being asked, how do you get that data? Um, and we host, you know, plethora of training webinars. Um, but I, was, I would also say, you know, we have a lot of partners that we also will point suppliers to. So for example, you know, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol has a couple, you know, obviously it holds the standard, but it has a couple of tools as well. Um, they can help suppliers start to calculate their scopes one, two, and three. Um, so it's, there's, there's a lot. And I think it, it depends, you know, what the supplier is looking for um, to really try to tailor to their needs um, can be, you know, a little bit trickier. So we have, we'd have to find the right tools. But um, yes, we have a whole support team in London to, to help them. Great. Yeah, I think I'm identifying with a little bit of what each of you are saying on this. Megan, you know, at, at Future 500, we um, you know, we focus so much on relationship building. So definitely uh, see the value of kind of those old school methods as well and kind of getting FaceTime and Philippe, same thing. I think if anything uh, is going <laughs> to come out of this time, it's it, for us, it's about, you know, taking those cold calls and making that connection and, you know, being more willing to be on video camera, right, instead of just on, on email or on the phone. So I think uh, all that's really valuable. Okay, perfect. We've got another question here um, that aligns well with something I did want to get to, which is around transparency. So I just wanted to ask you all, I know a few of you have mentioned this already. Um, a lot of companies mention, you know, transparency issues as kind of roadblocks in, you know, reaching back into their supply chains. So just wondering if you can speak to how you deal with that. And then we have an audience question regarding um, how do you use technology um, to monitor any transparency issues? So roadblocks, and then if there's a technology component, we'd love to hear about that. Anybody want to? lead us off? I can start us. So I would say from the transparency perspective, um, especially with a lot of the kind of leading customers or leading industry groups that we work with. So for example, the automotive sector has been, you know, working with their suppliers for a long time to try to understand the environmental impacts. Um, and I would say there's a there, the sense of transparency kind of exists. Now the question that's being raised is more about the data quality. 
Mm. Um, and so, you know, kind of taking the next step. Suppliers are, you know, disclosing and sharing, um, but it's a matter of making sure that that data is, you know, reflective and calculated um, correctly. So, I, and I would say also it's, you know, particularly for automotive sector or, or really manufacturing, it's, um, you know, you may, you can get a lot from your tier one suppliers, but there is still so much underneath that. So your tier two suppliers could actually have a greater, um, you know, percentage of your environmental um, or your carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. um, it could, yeah, the tier two could kind of make up more than the tier one, if that makes sense. Um, so, and, and that is, Tricky, and that's you know it's digging into the deeper layers. So some of the automotive customers that we work with have started, um, you know, I think they have very close relationships with their big tier one suppliers. Um, so having those conversations about you know what can you tell me about the next tier and and how are those sustainability conversations going? Um, so encouraging kind of the the trickle down or cascade effect, so that it's not just it's not just that you're receiving data from your tier one, but also that you're collecting data and insights from your tier two um, and eventually maybe tier three, but that's kind of where we are in the process right now. Great. Yeah. Anybody else want to speak to transparency? Yeah, sure. I think um, there are at least two, two dimensions of this that are on the table. I think the first is transparency in terms of information coming from suppliers and transparency in terms of disclosure and reporting. And I think for us, you know, we want to be part of enabling a virtuous circle if we can, um, where there's a race to the top in terms of transparency and there's clear and consistent expectation on companies and suppliers about how to report. And we appreciate CDP's role in that as well, that, as well as other organizations and institutions that are helping to clarify what is the expectation for business in terms of how should we be transparent on what we're doing in terms of climate risk and, and proactive action on climate. So I think, you know, that's really important. And I think, you know, CDP's own data, I believe, Pilar, has shown that as suppliers are asked to disclose that year on year, you actually see performance improvements. So it's not just transparency for transparency's sake, it's actually because it creates kind of a muscle and more of a focus internally as leadership is seeing that we're asked to report in this way consistently, and there's a number of investors and mainstream stakeholders who are asking for this information. And so I think, you know, transparency and reporting can also drive performance improvement, and that's why it's really important to us. And why we continue to participate in those channels and really want to show up and lend our, our voice and our purchasing power and, and influence where we can uh, to that kind of transparency and reporting. And then I think the second thread is transparency back into the supply chain, right? And how do you get more traceability? How do you see deeper into your upstream supply chain where maybe more of your emission sources are located? And how do you start to reveal those things? And I think for us, you know, similar to the comments that I made about prioritization overall, guiding our approach to supplier engagement, we take a similar approach when it comes to where do we need tra transparency or traceability? Um, you know, again, we, we can't do it everywhere with um, the same full-throated approach Approach. But if we know that our agricultural supply chain is a massive part of our footprint and our experience has showed us that um, our investments in trying to cut carbon out of our footprint in that section of our supply chain are really effective, then that tells us that investing the time and effort into getting more transparency and traceability into those supply chains is warranted. So we've used that same kind of principle to help guide and say, okay, these are the key categories where we really want to dig in and either, as Pilar mentioned, through our tier one suppliers begin to get more visibility into tier two and so on. Mm -hmm. But we've taken that approach of saying, okay, where are the emissions coming from? Where do we see reduction potential? Where do we see ROI for trying to invest in getting those carbon reductions and using that as our guiding light on where we need to enhance our transparency and traceability upstream. Great. And Philippe, is transparency something you want to weigh in on? We have a flood of, uh, of audience questions. So let me know if we, if, uh, well, I, yeah, to... all I'll say is I think that, you know, the visibility is key and, and being being held to that reporting standard. So, you know, where, for example, we've had an integrated annual report um, since 2011 at, at the group level, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that again, that just it drives its disclosure. And once you get into that that habit of, and a requirement of disclosing information, I, I would agree entirely with the panel, you know, it drives much better behavior. So we, we do see very significant responses from our tier one suppliers. And, and Pilar, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we will now begin to trace down 
tier two, tier three as well. We're getting much better at understanding how we can enable our suppliers uh, to, to reduce the, their impacts. And, and obviously that, that that is to our benefit too. Yeah. So you just mentioned the word um, requirement. And I'm hoping we can dig into this a little bit more because we have another audience question that says, um, are you able to enforce carbon reduction practices in, uh, with your suppliers or are you taking a more voluntary approach? So can you just talk a little bit about what, what does requirement mean? So from our perspective, requirement would be, would be within our companies in the group. So we, we look okay. at our, our, our own group behavior. Um, I think what you'll find increasingly, and, and I, I mentioned this as we look at the SMEs around the clean tech clusters as an example, mm -hmm. is, is um, suppliers themselves are starting to identify where they are going to be more attractive. And, and if you can demonstrate a, a smaller water footprint, a smaller waste profile, uh, closing the waste loop component within your supply chain, that's very attractive to us. And again, I, I go back to that forward facing customer experience mm -hmm. where you've got products that you know meet those criteria. If I'm a supplier of, of combustible, um, uh, you know, some form of biodegradable um, product, uh, you know, for a, with regard to tableware, for example, in flight, you know, I know that I'm, I'm going to have a much better opportunity uh, with Cathay Pacific because I'm, I'm very aware of what they're trying to do and what they're trying to achieve. So I think that that level of visibility from the supply chain is also um, is very, very valuable. Great. Um, let's see here. I'm just scrolling through uh, through some of our questions. Um, somebody's asking about the most challenging aspect in terms of management, measuring, and reporting of emissions. So just briefly, does somebody want to weigh in on challenges here for suppliers? And maybe how you're addressing some of those challenges as well? I know we touched on this with the SME question. Yeah, I can offer a few thoughts. I think, um, sorry, Pilar, did you want to come in there? Go ahead. Megan, okay. let's go ahead and then we can, we can go to Pilar. Yeah. Good. Um, I think for us, you know, uh, you know, when we think about the sweep of our sustainability agenda, carbon emissions is actually one of the most measurable uh, aspects of what we're trying to do. If you put it alongside other commitments that we and other companies have around human rights, around social issues, actually look at the carbon side and the environmental side as a, a bit of a breath of fresh air in terms of the challenges with measurement. Mm -hmm. Not to say it isn't difficult and time consuming and you do need to establish clear processes and you know, probably have a team or at least a person within the company who's um, you know really smart on carbon accounting and can take the lead in in establishing that. But um, you know that for us hasn't been as much of a challenge. I think the bigger challenge um, is you know things like share of mind and just priority level with suppliers, especially in a moment uh, like the one that we're living through now. There are so many urgencies facing every business in just keeping the lights on, keeping workers paid, keeping everyone safe and healthy, um, and even in a a, in a moment of normalcy, if we can even call it that, um, you know, establishing how sustainability fits relative to other priorities, um, keeping it top of mind, keeping the right focus on it. I think that's the area where we have the most challenge uh, in, in keeping it top of mind with suppliers. And Pilar, did you want to chime in? Um, sure, yes. I was just going to say for, you know, keeping, getting, it really depends on the supplier's um, journey, kind of where they are in this process. And I would say um, if a supplier has not yet started to measure their emissions, then they, they, they're not going to be in a stage to ma manage those emissions yet. Um, so I think it is a matter of identifying kind of where a supplier is in their trajectory, if you think of it kind of as an upward curve. Um, and kind of coming to them. So, you know, it's a you want to meet them in the middle. Um, and so I would say it depends on where they are, but um, if they are already measuring, then you can work with them to start, um, you know, setting targets and actually reducing emissions. Um, but that's kind of my, my one piece of advice would be to see where they are first. Great. Um, and just a little time check, we've got about 15 minutes left. So we'll try to get through a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, we, Megan, you just mentioned um, social social issues, um, 
and kind of carbon being a breath of fresh air in terms of the quantitative. But we do have a question um, about uh, how how any of you are engaging beyond carbon, and that may include social issues. So I know the focus of our conversation today is, is around carbon and climate, but if anybody just wants to briefly weigh in, um, I think that would be be welcome around social issues. Yeah, we could spend another ball. We could spend another hour easily on. Of course, on, yeah, just briefly. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and I think you know, for us, when we think about the work that we're doing on greenhouse gas emissions, we try to also come to suppliers with a rounded view on sustainability. So the conversations that we're having about our priorities uh, on our climate target are also sitting alongside our human rights commitments and our focus on social issues. So I think we're giving this a one-dimensional look today because of the topic of our of our webinar. But we do, um, you know, we very much do come to suppliers with um, with the yeah the sweep of what we're looking to do in sustainability. Sustainability. And I think maybe a couple of quick examples. You know, we run a, what we call our sustainable sourcing program, which is more of a social compliance focused program where we run our, our largest and most important suppliers through it every year. There's code of conduct compliance, there's annual self assessment, there's auditing that's done at the manufacturing level um, that's checking on things like working hours and wages and uh, working conditions and these kinds of topics. So we have a, a complete end-to-end -end program that's also engaging many of the same suppliers that we're talking to about carbon emissions on these kinds of social issues in their facilities and plants and sites. So that's one way that we're doing this. And then of course, in our more sensitive supply chains where we know that there are um, potential human rights risks or impacts that we are aware of. We have a whole suite of whether it's impact programs that we establish at origin to um, help tackle some of those issues really at their root um, or partnering with uh, industry groups or nonprofits to be able to address some of the more systemic human rights issues. We um, have quite a raft of initiatives um, on those topics. Great. Philippe, I'm just wondering, um, if you might have an interesting perspective on this, or, you know, you mentioned that about the company having like thinking in decades and generations rather than short term thinking. Wonder if you have um, thoughts around social issue engagement just briefly. Yeah, obviously slightly different um, from an aviation perspective. But if I, if I, if I take the, the group perspective, I mean, clearly for us, uh, community is essential. If you're thinking in terms of generations, um, you, you've got you've got to earn the right to be in business. And, and that, that's really sort of the overarching piece for us is what are we doing in our local communities to, to, to engage appropriately, uh, whether we're an employer, whether we are an impactor. Um, you know, if you think of it, it, the emissions footprints around an airport, for example, you know, there's, there's community impact. There's a noise footprint mm -hmm. to that. And you think of health and safety. I mean, clearly, in, in aviation terms for Cali Pacific, safety is, is absolutely number one. How does that translate into our supply chain, and what are the you know the health health and safety factors to ensure a safe working environment for everybody who's working within that supply chain? So, I, I guess the, the reason that I mentioned that we think in terms of, of of decades and generations is that we're not look always looking to squeeze every single dollar out of every single deal. You know, there is an understanding that you you, you want to have best practice. You want to be encouraging best practice whether it's in a safety environment or, or, or with a community uh, engagement. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a good position to be in. And, and, and as Megan says, I mean, we, we list all of these areas far beyond just the, the, the carbon footprint scope. Um, and we come all the way back to our reporting, because if you are reporting on these factors, um, whether it's in an annual report, whether it's a stock exchange requirement, you know, you, you are going to want to be working with suppliers who are equally as motivated to deliver in those areas. Great. Um, bouncing back to um, our carbon conversation, just want to talk about um, kind of setting setting realistic targets. Um, you know, we've talked about supplier engagement and kind of the measurement and management. How do you go about um, working through targets with suppliers? And Pilar, maybe we can start start with you and you can give us a uh, a quick overview of some of the um, science-based targets updates you mentioned. Happy to, yes. So I would say kind of in general, again, um, the supplier targets depend on where a supplier is. So a target may be for them to simply disclose. Another target may be for them to reduce emissions or um, you know, increase the renewable energy use. 
So um, I'd say, you know, on that front, it, it kind of depends on what your goals are and what you want your suppliers to be focused on. Um, now, kind of going back to the science-based targets update, um, we, gosh, within the past few weeks, released um, new, uh, I guess, n a new methodology for small to medium enter enterprises. Um, so for the 1.5 degree aligned pathway, um, if you're, you know, company with less than 500 employees, the request or kind of the, the path, the goal, the target that must be set is to reduce scope one and two emissions by 50% by 2030 from a 2018 baseline. And with the two degree scenario, it's by 30% rather than 50. Um, and so there's not as much of, there's not kind of that quantitative um, demand and focus on the mm -hmm. scope three component. There is the request that those um, companies measure and manage their scope three, but it's not the same kind of rigor that larger companies are held to. Um, so that's kind of the, the big update uh, on that front. And I think it'll make it a lot, kind of the barrier to entry and getting a science-based target Great. approved is now much more realistic for those smaller companies. Hmm, that's great. Um, Megan or Philippe, anything around um, working with suppliers on setting targets? Sure. Yeah, I'd say in general, you know, we don't see our role as, as setting targets for suppliers. Mm -hmm. We see our role as helping to enable suppliers to see the clear business imperative and business benefits, whether it's because a customer like us sees it as important or because their own stakeholders in their own right as businesses also see it as important or they've done a climate risk assessment or they're seeing physical impacts to uh, to their company. So we see our role much more around you know, education, awareness raising about the importance of climate change, showing some of the solutions and best practices to set them on a path, and then you know, showing up to be an accountable partner to check in on progress. So we might use a tool like a supplier scorecard in some of our categories where we're reviewing their progress toward you know, certain aspirations. And, and that might be a, a softer touch approach that we use, but in general, we're not setting targets for them. We're instead trying to create a pathway and create on-ramps for suppliers, maybe requesting them to start reporting to CDP could be one way to start them on, a, on the journey. Uh, we may try to highlight the leadership and performance of other suppliers that are doing really well and using that as a bit of a carrot starting, I think as Philippe mentioned, starting to get suppliers to see this as a bit of competitive differentiation for them as we look across the options that we have on who we could partner with and who we can uh, work with to source our, our materials. So those are some of the approaches that we'd use um, rather than setting a firm target. Yeah, really like lead by example, it sounds like. And Philippe, thoughts here? Well, we're driven by industry targets, obviously, um, and Corsia is the, is, the, is the major tool that we'll use in the marketplace mechanisms within that. Um, and, and really, to, to Megan's point about best practice, you know, our, our role is, is to outperform those targets. Mm -hmm. and, and the way that Cathay does that primarily is, is through fleet renewal, actually. Um, it's, it's as simple as making sure that you're investing in the, the highest quality products in, in, in this example. Um, aircraft technology to reduce your overall uh, footprint and seek to outperform the industry targets and again for us that's because it's a point of differentiation and we do believe as we sort of bring all the transparency and reporting bits together we do think that the, the consumer customer is going to be a major driving force in in pushing that best practice and that best behavior so we feel that it's in our interest and clearly in our supply chain's interest to be uh, enabling us to outperform those those industry targets. Great. Um, I do, I, I know we've been kind of talking in the context of uh, a pre-COVID world. So before we wrap up, I do just want to ask um, for your thoughts about supplier engagement in, you know, a COVID changed world and how that might affect, um, you know, what you're doing or how you're thinking about this conversation. I know that's a big question to <laughs> to bite off, but well, sure. let, let me kick off because I think uh, travel and transportation is probably quite uh, quite uppermost in a lot of people's minds. But it, but it, it speaks to really the theme of our, our panel discussion, which is that engagement with suppliers. Clearly, we have now got to be able to provide a safe travel environment. How do we do that? 
there are a whole host of different ways. We use the technology that exists today that people didn't know about. I'm sure now you know more about aircraft filtration systems than you ever thought you would. You know, the HEPA filters that we have on, on board our aircraft, which are of operating theater quality for the air that is being recycled in, in, the, in the cabin. But clearly we're going to need to have uh, elements within the airport environment. You know, what, what, what are the decontamination processes that we can go through? What are the, the, the social distancing methodologies or, or uh, food production and food service? These, all of these kinds of areas within, within the industry as we know them today are clearly going to have to change. So we will have to reach into our supply chain and say, okay, now we, we, we can't offer food in the cabin in the way that we did. How can we do it? What are the opportunities within that space for suppliers to uh, to come up with with novel and safe mm -hmm. uh, processes and, and 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 enable us to provide, as I say, a, a healthy and safe travel environment. So actually, while it's a pretty dismal time right now, the opportunities in there are, are very significant. And Megan, um, thoughts about COVID? Impact? Yeah, I think for for us, I mean, virtually all suppliers and really all business businesses have been impacted in some way by COVID. And I think we as buyers and as champions for supplier engagement and the ones that have the carbon reduction target that are wanting to champion this, I think, you know, we need to hold that knowledge front and center when we consider supplier engagement priorities at this time. So for us, you know, this doesn't mean at all a change to our sustainability ambitions, but it does mean in the short term being mindful and a bit more flexible with suppliers in our expectations of them and the timing of some of the projects that we were hoping to establish. So just bringing a practical approach to recognize the situation that we're in, but also not wavering from our midterm and long-term ambitions. So I think that's really key. And I think, you know, this time has also revealed a number of really positive elements about our suppliers and our supply chains. And I imagine other businesses would, would share this as well. I think, you know, some of the creativity and the resourcefulness that we've seen both within our, within our own business and with our suppliers in terms of being able to pivot and change process and deliver things in timelines that were once, you know, completely impossible. I think these are some new muscles around being nimble, around being reflex, uh, being flexible, responsive, being able to change business as usual in a situation where the urgency demands something different, I think are the kinds of skills and muscles that we need to be able to really meet our moment in terms of climate change. So I'm hoping that some of those muscles will stick around post-COVID or in whatever next normal looks like so that we can draw on that to really uh, achieve our, our carbon goals. Great. And we are uh, coming up on the hour here, but Pilar just wanted to give you um, a brief minute to respond as well around COVID impacts. Yes, I would say I echo a lot of what Megan just said. So in the sense that none of our customers have stopped their supplier engagement. Um, I would say the only thing that's kind of been modified is the frequency or tone of communication. So, um, you know, kind of giving that flexibility and that understanding to suppliers. Um, and then from CDP's perspective, our disclosure cycle typically runs from April to July, and we've extended that um, into late August. So giving a little bit more um, time and flexibility. Great. And um, so, as I mentioned, we're just coming up on the hour, but so in maybe just uh, like a brief 30 seconds, I would love to just hear any final thoughts or um, key points that you really wanted to uh, to hammer in for us. Anybody uh, want to start to close us out here? Sure, I can start. I think um, you heard from me a number of times, but I think prioritization is really key. And I think um, coming to suppliers from a place of respect and recognizing that they are businesses in their own right with their own objectives and culture and stakeholders and motivators um, and really coming to them as, as equal partners and bringing that respect, I think is really beneficial. And I think one last point on um, this unique moment that we're in, I think, you know, we're really seeing a surge in the importance of the concept of supply chain resilience. And we're seeing our own internal folks think a bit differently about our risk assessment process, about the importance of having a resilient supply chain. And I think there's such an opportunity for all of us as sustainability practitioners and climate focused practitioners, especially to really link up those discussions and help our businesses to see that resilient supply chains are also ones that are low carbon supply chains.
Great. And Philippe, last 30 seconds, final thoughts? Yeah, I would just echo the prioritization piece from a supplier's perspective. If you can understand what Cathay Pacific's priorities are uh, within the decarbonizing uh, space, uh, within the waste space, within the water footprint space, you know, you're going to be very well positioned to enabling us to drive our business forward and, and, and secure that business. Great. And Pilar? Yes, I would say, um, you know, maintain the sense of balance between your idealist self and the realist um, that you need to approach suppliers with and understand that each supplier is going to have different needs. So your expectations, you know, while, while you may have high expectations, and that's what we encourage, um, they will, you know, probably vary from supplier to supplier. Great. Um, well, this this turned out to be a really positive conversation. Hearing a lot about two-way street and you know leading by example and um, you know finding kind of that that business incentive for decarbonization. So, really want to thank all of our um, panelists for um, what I found to be a, a great conversation. I'm gonna have to go check out some of those new science-based target updates. Um, but Ed, we will uh, turn it back over to you. Thank you, Ellen. Um... Yeah, just a, a small note from me. Firstly, thank you to our, our speakers today um, for sharing their insights and also to, to everyone who's attended today and especially as well. Sorry, forgot to mention, thank you very much, Ellen, for moderating and leading the discussion as well. Special thanks for that. Um, we're next, uh, the next piece of content we're running, uh, we've got a webinar on ESG going mainstream uh, next um, Wednesday. Um, so yeah, look out for that. We've just communicated that um, to, um, everyone as, as this webinar has been going on. And we've also got the Responsible Business Summit Week, uh, which is a virtual event taking place on the 8th and the 16th of June as well. Uh, so um, between the 8th and the 16th, sorry. So yeah, please, please do check those out. And um, I look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks, Thanks so everyone. much, everybody. Thank you.